Hey, how's everybody doing today? Thanks for coming to our little session here. It's a lot more than we expected, so that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Kitzmiller. I am a professional services engineer with Jamf Software. Uh, and I first met uh, Joe Schramm, who's going to be presenting today, uh, about a year ago, just after the JNUC at a uh, CJA course taught by uh, Mikey Paul up here in the back row. Uh, we've kind of been uh, been buddies ever since, and he's always talking about these these grand ideas about uh, you know where technology is going, where you know modern uh, solutions providers are going, and uh, I wanted to bring him to the JNUC to have him talk about that with you guys because I think he's got a lot of great ideas, uh, and he's got a lot to get through. So I'm just going to hand it over to him and let him run. So, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Schramm. Thanks, man. Hey, thanks for coming. So this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about myself. I'm going to talk about a concept that I like to call the new frontier. And I'm going to talk about some of the work about what we've been doing in our shop uh, to do that. So um, I'm Joe. I'm from North Carolina. If you know anything about North Carolina and you're in the Apple world, you probably know us for two reasons. One, um, we have all your iCloud data. And don't worry, there's no earthquakes or hurricanes in North Carolina, so you're in pretty good shape. Um, the other thing about North Carolina is we've got an area called the Research Triangle. Back in the 1950s, our state government did an investment that encouraged IBM and other companies to come and build this little tech zone in what was a primarily manufacturing and textile-driven state. So today we've got IBM, Lenovo, uh, Cisco, BASF, and lots of others. Um, the other thing we have is a lot of basketball because we've got Duke, Chapel Hill, NC State. Everybody talks about basketball. It's like the obsession. Um, this is downtown Raleigh. And in downtown Raleigh, we've got Red Hat, Citrix, and also my firm, Sparktivity, although that is not to scale. Uh, <laughs> this is my team. This is our core team. And when we started our shop in uh, 2009, we decided we were going to do some things a little bit differently. Our team has a background in design, advertising, applied mathematics, professional photography, journalism, um, and a nonprofit background as well. And you know, we decided uh, we were going to start targeting certain types of clients, professional service firms, nonprofits. We do a little bit of government stuff. But you know, besides those non-IT backgrounds, we also, uh, my business partner and I had some VAR experience, and we had worked internal IT. So we had been around a little bit, and we had seen some things, and that stuck with us, and we made some decisions about what we are going to do differently with this firm uh, about five years ago versus what we had done in the past. So I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Uh, this is the hardware buying guide at Apple Insider. Um, I like to say this is why some Apple VARs are having a really hard life. Um, what this shows you is that there's a lot of places where you can buy all this stuff. And the bottom line is, this stuff costs what it costs. And that's just all there is to it. So when I was working at the VAR, we were very excited about hardware. We would sell a big system with a lot of storage. We would get pretty pumped up about that. And what I saw us doing was giving away our expertise, giving away our know-how about how to actually implement that stuff successfully and help a business. Um, and when I realized we were more excited about something with 10% profit margin than we were about something with 30% profit margin, I decided that something had to change. So at Spartivity, we decided to flip this around and decide that expertise is more important than equipment. So we believe this can't be bought at Amazon. Um, we believe that we're a professional services firm. That's how we talk about ourselves. So I like to say, uh, when you get in that conversation with clients about hardware, I, I made this joke last night to a couple Canadians, and they didn't know what I was talking about. But it's the, I'm not going to pay a lot for this muffler conversation. right? So I figured when we started the firm, we would lead with knowledge. We would pass the gear through at cost. Um, we would be high touch. We would be white glove. We would give great service. And I figured you know, 2009, we'd ride the wave of Apple popularity. A lot of people are switching. I figured we'd be doing a lot of OS 10, OS 10 server, uh, mobility stuff, and we'd be helping these businesses make the switch. Um, the other thing is I had this vague idea that my design background might be useful in those particular industries, and that it might be useful in our own marketing materials. But I, I couldn't really think about it very much more past that. Um, 
And we were busy in the first couple years. We had a lot of those traditional clients switching. We had some Mac first shops as well that we were also helping out. But in January 2010, something big happened that made me rethink our entire business and what we were doing. You may have seen that. For some reason before that, I got that the iPhone was a thing, it was an important thing, it was, a, it was a peripheral, I was thinking about it kind of like in an iTunes, an iPod kind of way, but I didn't see it as this harbinger for this big change that was coming. And the first time I used an iPad, that became crystal clear. So then it's like, huh, what do, what do we do about that? So this idea of the new frontier, I wanna back up for just a second, way back, about 50 years back. Um, I had a slide for basketball, but actually I don't know anything about basketball or sports. The thing that I know about is politics. That's what I spend my time following. Lots of interesting things going on with that these days. And in a story from politics, um, this is John F. Kennedy at his 1960 acceptance speech at the Democratic National Convention. And he had a slogan in his speech that he used to inspire America to support him and the ideas that he was going after. And in his speech he said, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier the frontier of the 1960s, the frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, the frontier of unfulfilled hopes and unfulfilled dreams. Beyond that frontier is an uncharted area of science and space, of unsolved problems of peace and war, unconquered problems of ignorance and prejudice, unanswered questions of poverty and surplus. And what he meant was that things were changing, that the new was taking over from the old, that people were gonna be more at the center of power and what's going on, that society is changing, that big risks are being taken and big advances are being made. So, you know, that's what that meant at that particular time in history. And, you know, if we fast forward back to the recent now, what was happening in our firm around 2010 was we were seeing that all this stuff was going on. We were, we were getting psyched about a lot of new things that were happening and we felt like things were making a turn towards something new, but we couldn't quite articulate what that was. So in the tech sector alone, I knew that things were changing, but I also knew that things were changing culturally, kind of underneath, a layer underneath just that tech part. You know, we knew that the iPad and the iPhone had a lot to do with that and were a big part of that. And one day on a whim, I was in a client meeting describing this and I just threw out the term New Frontier. And at our firm, after that, that totally stuck, and we just used that all the time as like an internal term, and then we start catching ourselves in client meetings, realizing that people don't know what we're talking about, so we have to kind of back up and explain what that is. It's not just the tech, it's not just the culture, it's business norms, it's how people work together. There's a lot of things changing right now. We all know it, we all see it. And like I said, it was hard to define, it was a gut feeling, but when I saw this, I knew that this was part of it. So. What does that mean for 2010? Here's my best shot at defining what that is. Sometimes it's hard to define an era when you're in the middle of it, so this is loose, and I don't exactly know how to call it, but you know, this new frontier, it's an era where efficiency and resource stewardship are valued over the inertia of existing methods. This is HP's Moonshot server project, which is a response to Facebook's open compute and open stack project. You know, HP was directly challenged in what they were doing, and they had to, they had to respond with a new way of thinking about things. The new frontier now is where people-first design is not just an advantage, it's a market differentiator for vertical disruption. It's a place where self-organized employees can build a successful company without a manager in the building. It's a, it's a place in time where a common interest can pull people together, pull their resources together in a way that not, was not possible before, where sharing work and providing open access to information leads to a stronger ecosystem. It's also a place where people with big ideas don't have to wait for inter intermediaries. They can just do the thing that they want to do, and where a tight cycle of innovation uh, followed by iteration can lead to a totally new economy. So these are the attributes we started watching out for, the things that we call new frontier in my shop. So we started asking ourselves, what do we need to do to be more new frontier? How can we be a SpaceX and not a NASA? How can we be a Tesla and not a Ford? Against this backdrop, I started looking at our own challenges 
regarding being New Frontier, and I found three big things we needed to work on. So the first one was wasted effort. My business partner and I, at this point in time, there was only the two of us, and we were working our butts off with all the client work, and this was not cutting it as far as a strategy for how to deal with this problem. <laughs> so I was at an ACN Channel Camp event in 2010, and I saw a demo of the Casper Suite, and I realized that not only was it best practice, this would totally free us up. It would be the answer to, to what we needed to do. And at that point, I was only thinking about us and what our needs were, but I can say for sure what I think everybody here knows is that it does free up your time to get your life back. So that actually helped us a lot. We were able to delay new hires for about a year and our revenue and our profit was, was still going up, even though we didn't have more overhead. So I like to say this is the first essential thing I learned from Jamf Software, which is the power of automation that actually directly helped us solve that problem of wasted effort. So the other thing was our current historical offering. So it turns out that focusing on traditional Mac shops and trying to help PC shops turn towards the Mac wasn't quite the whole answer. Yes, there are firms making that turn and we were doing that work, but we realized that we were struggling to provide value in a different kind of environment, an environment that lacks a traditional business structure, um, an environment full of younger employees who have grown up with this technology or who are skeptical that we have any value to provide whatsoever. That happens. So I can tell you that as a solutions provider, we can't sell fear. We can't say don't do X, Y, or Z without us because otherwise something bad will happen. The barriers to success for regular people are lowering as they should. And um, there's a guy in North Carolina who works at NC State. His name's Everett Allen. He's a technology leader at NC State. And I went to the, the Jamf Regional Conference a couple years ago in Raleigh, and he put this in a really great way. He said, as IT people, we've spent 30 years scaring people, telling them they can't do things, that they need us or else. But now they don't need us to do those things. And that's a good thing. So we have to act fast to not be seen as an obstacle to their success. Now, this is a stereotype. We all know that. And for that matter, so is this. But I can tell you that it's hard not to be seen as the obstacle when you come in calling yourself IT because of people's current expectations. It's a trigger word. It gets them thinking in a certain way. So this right here is a team of designers at Dropbox. But imagine that it's any new startup in your town, wherever you live. As a solutions provider, what are you going to go in and offer these businesses as a technologist? Well, hardware is a commodity. Basic support is a commodity. Uh, mobile support is a commodity. How many problems are you seeing for the majority of your users doing self-service, zero-day iOS upgrades? I'm not seeing a lot of problems with that. OS 10. You know, we, we saw some of those problems in the earlier years of OS 10, but 10.7 to 10.8? Not that big of a deal. 10.8 to 10.9, probably less big of a deal. Probably less, re less of a reason to hold your breath. I'm not saying these tools are perfect, or even these particular examples, but give it another couple of years, and what you have to ask is, are you needed to help people navigate these decisions any further? And should you be needed to help them navigate these decisions any further? So have you tried telling anyone lately that they need a help desk contract on their iPad, or that a managed services support contract is required for software updates on their iPhone? I haven't told anyone that, and the reason is I think they would laugh at me if I told them that. So what happens to the traditional managed services business model when these kids graduate and enter the workforce? It's not about young versus old. It's the contrast between being a digital native and a digital immigrant, the people who've grown up with ubiquitous technology. What are we going to be offering them? Because actually, the first round of those people are entering the workforce and are already in the workforce, and they're starting businesses. So the third thing was, how do we pivot towards that and define a new offering. So at Sparktivity, we knew what to do here, and we knew what to do here, but it was becoming hard to navigate what are we going to provide here. These businesses are already living and breathing New Frontier in a lot of ways. As long as we're pitching ourselves as a more traditional firm, you know, as long as we're pitching ourselves to a traditional firm, not much has to change. But once you go here, you have to start thinking about who you are and what you're doing. So I knew that this was still right but I knew that there was more to it than that. There was some nuance here that I didn't quite understand. So I started looking for answers. I kept my eyes and ears open, and I went on the hunt to see what I could find, and I got lucky. I found three things that were really useful. The first one was I came across uh, an article by a guy named Scott Belsky. Scott Belsky created a thing called the Behance Network. It's a community 
online for designers to put their portfolios up and share work with each other. He sold it to Adobe. Uh, he's now their vice president of community. And he, he's written a couple of great books, especially ones on making ideas happen. You should check him out because he's a smart guy. But he wrote an article called A Manifesto for Free Radicals. Less paperwork, less waiting, and more action. Google that. I got a link to it at the end. It was a piece largely about the values he sees in these younger trending workplaces. And he gave a list of self-identified characteristics of these folks who are working from this new playbook. So here were those characteristics. We do work that is first and foremost intrinsically rewarding. We demand freedom, whether we work within companies or on our own. We make stuff often, and therefore we fail often. We have little tolerance for the friction of bureaucracy, old boy networks, or antiquated business practice. We expect to be fully utilized and constantly optimized, regardless of whether we're working in a startup or a large organization. We consider open source technology, APIs, and the vast collective knowledge of the internet to be our personal arsenal. We believe that networking is sharing. We believe in meritocracy and the power of online networks and peer communities to advance our ability to do what we love. And we make a great living doing what we love. We consider ourselves to be both artisans and business people. Now, when I read that, I found myself agreeing with that 100%. And I also found myself thinking about places that I had worked or how some of my more existing, my existing traditional clients would react to these values. And I had a pretty good idea of how they would react. Um, it's a common refrain that millennials are spoiled and insufferable. And maybe there's some truth in that. But actually, I agree with those values that Scott has. And I know that no matter how old you are, you've heard that song before, that this next generation is the one screwing everything up. My grandparents thought these folks were ruining America. But really, they were part of a cultural movement that inspired many to overturn the old ways and start thinking about new things. Capturing their generation's zeitgeist and figuring out how to apply that to the business problems of the day certainly worked for these gentlemen. And in fact, that generation's changing social norms are a huge reason why the personal computer industry started in the first place. So I think we could learn a thing or two by paying attention to what these values are, that there's a cultural aspect to New Frontier. And it's not just about the tech products or the web. It's about something that drives the people that drive those things. And we have to understand that in our businesses and in our professional practice. So that was the first thing. The second thing, aside from Sparktivity in our town in Raleigh, for many years, I've been a volunteer and a board member of the local chapter of AIGA, which is the Professional Association for Design. More on that in a minute. Anyway, the second lucky thing I came across that helped me understand how our firm needed to change was that I heard this guy give a talk, AIGA's executive director, Rick Griffey. And at this conference, he spoke about the changing role of designers in society. The way he framed his points about this change in their profession hit me like a bolt of lightning because I realized it totally applied to what I do what we all do in a very significant way. Here's a portion of the slides that he presented that day. Rick started out talking about how the job of a designer originally started here in the bottom left as a maker of physical artifact. And how now the place where designers provide the most value is in the top right at the strategic level where they help come up with ways to solve business problems. And designers are navigating that change in focus over the duration and the distance of their careers. Attributes of a modern designer that he presented, those are very much in line with what Scott was talking about. Here's another way to look at that journey. As a designer matures, their ability to provide return on investment to their clients looks like this. Yes, they're doing styling at the beginning, but they're solving problems, and then they're moving on to actually help design the business itself and how it should work. Another thing the designer brings in the value to business is strategic thinking combined with empathy, plus the ability to communicate those concepts clearly. So what a designer does now isn't just about objects, it's about systems, ecosystems, and about culture too. Design thinking is the term that this profession uses to talk about this process of solving problems. It's the difference between what you do and how you do it. I blew this one up because this is detail on what that process looks like. You should Google this and check it out. There's a great documentary about it as well that uh, came out last year. By the way, they funded that documentary on Kickstarter. And the last thing he talked about is that a big goal of the profession at this point was to help designers move from the edges of society and business to the center where important things are happening, where decisions are made. 
And if you think about a traditional business, you know, there's finance people there, there's legal people, there's sales, they're all providing input on strategy. Why not a designer helping make those decisions? Why not a technologist helping make those decisions? So there was one more takeaway here that I found really valuable was, was this demonstrate value by doing valuable things. I'm gonna come back to that. And the, and, and the last thing he talked about was that uh, the end product is one thing, but the content and the context over time is what creates an experience. And we're gonna come back to that too. Um, he also talked about how open access to information and collaboration with, uh, with communities that are based on access to exclusive knowledge, they're being disrupted. You know, here's, a, here's exclusive knowledge, here's exclusive products, and here's a store where you can get both of those things at the same time. So the answer to combating that is to switch our way of working to something that cannot be commoditized, something that integrates what we're already doing without realizing it, and which repositions us to lead with a new value proposition. So what does all this design stuff have to do with us, with being a new frontier type consultant or integrator? I think there's something very important to be learned here, which is that how we think about ourselves matters, how we shift what we're providing to our clients, what it's like to take a journey from the edge of the business conversation to the center of the business conversation, to move away from a focus on artifact and move to a focus on strategic value. And this experience piece is a big deal. So the truth is, in a way, design and technology these days are two sides of the same coin. They're about problem solving in complex environments. As a solutions provider, I'm required to create value by integrating business goals and implementation requirements into a people first solution. That's what I do, complex problem solving. It's the fundamental skill set of a designer. There's a continuity there between the, that work and the way I was trained in design school and that's why I call myself a systems designer. Here's another way of looking at those two approaches. As a group of technology professionals, we've been living on the left for a very long time to great effect. But if you're in this room, my guess is you have some taste and that you actually value design Right? So the question is, what can we learn from the other side of the coin here and apply to our own practice? Here's a very quick example that's fresh in everyone's mind. How's this experience going these days? And is that a traditional design problem? Or is it a traditional technology problem? Or is it a positioning problem? What kind of experience are people having with this right now? So I want to give you two quick examples. I, the last thing I did on this journey was I started looking at other new frontier companies to see what they're doing that I could learn from what they were doing. And I took a deep look at them. What are they doing that's working? What are their shared values and techniques that are being so successful in the marketplace? Here's two successful companies we can look at to try to learn about this. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when you're competing in a market where the other guy is trying to rip you off or is giving away something that could be compared with part of what you do, how do you respond to that? You fight back by creating an experience for your clients, something that cannot be commoditized. So let's look at these two firms as experience-driven firms. Let's start with Apple. As Steve famously said, design isn't just what it looks like, it's how it works. Apple's been talking about this intersection of technology and what they call the liberal arts for many years. It's a big part of their brand. Uh, you may have seen this slide before in a Steve keynote. It's also a metaphor we use in our own hiring process. So let's map this experience. Form plus content plus context over time equals experience. Form is color. Form is style. Form is fit and finish. Form is craftsmanship. Content is what rides inside. Games, photos, music, movies, just about anything at this point. Context. Context is actually the core idea behind iOS 7. If you've read anything about their thinking, the big long article that was in Bloomberg Business Week, adding context to iOS 7 via transparency, enhanced sense of place and depth was the original design prompt for doing that work. Context is designing for where I am right now. It's on the lock screen, it's on the home screen, it's on any screen. Context is I'm opening this product for the very first time. What am I going to see? What does that look like? And all that leads to an experience, a moment, an emotion. If you haven't seen uh, this video yet I'm about to show, take a look at it. It's Apple's thinking on experience design right from Johnny Ive.
So that's Apple. What about Jamf? Same formula. Let's go through a story that should be familiar to every person in this room if you've used the Casper Suite. When I download the Casper Suite software, I get a bespoke, well-branded experience right in the installer DMG. Uh, when I'm in this folder, where am I right now? I'm clearly in the world of Jamf. What happens sometime later, maybe a couple weeks, is this shows up in my mailbox. Now, the copy on here could be totally framing everything around the purchase of software, but that's not what it talks about. Instead, it talks about the fact that I'm now part of a community called Jamf Nation. Then, I get invited to signal to other people that I'm part of this community. That's an artifact. And it's not just vaporware or marketing fluff, the community actually exists. Jamf has done the hard work to create it and feed it, and you can experience it here, or you can experience it here. And when you up your engagement with Jamf and their experience, they recognize you right back with a designed artifact that enhances that context. Hell, they even do it internally, not just with their customers, but with their own employees. Uh, if you don't know, ask your account manager what Jamf Week is, which just concluded. So it makes you ask yourself, is the vaunted jumpstart a revenue thing? Or is it to ensure that customers get the best possible experience, the best possible value from this product? Who else in this vertical would stick to their guns like that? Is Jamf a software company? Or are they selling something that no one else in their vertical can offer or would even try to offer? I think the fact that we're here actually tells us the answer to that. This is not a warehouse that we're having this meeting in. So they're fighting off and beating larger competitors and huge megacorps who can't muster an ounce of the loyalty on display here this week. I think we need to pay attention to Jamf as a company because we can learn a lot from how they actually run their business, not just the products. So I, I like to say that's the second thing I've learned from Jamf, that they're actually an experience design company because they design the total experience of using that product for us. So companies like Jamf and Apple, they're out front. They're doing the heavy lifting. They're doing these Herculean tasks to move things forward to create the new frontier. And I've realized that as a small firm, the key is to draft behind this movement and these companies and align oneself not just with popular technologies or design aesthetics, but with where the trend line is going in society as a whole. In a way, Jamf themselves are drafting a bigger player, right? Jamf knows that when you're the leader of the pack in a cutthroat industry, the brake pedal is not an option. So Apple is not going to slow down for anyone, not their friends, not for the haters, not for their own employees, not even to protect their existing product categories. At Sparktivity, we know we have to do the same thing. When you know you're on the bike behind the semi, you understand that the folks you're drafting don't owe you anything and that that truck is not slowing down for you. You've got to make yourself aerodynamic. You've got to find the sweet spot. You've got to pay attention so you don't get squished. So how do we live this? Well, there are many things I've picked up along the way in the last couple of years. But those three things have been great touchstones in figuring out what to do next. It turns out that succeeding in business today means that you're all likely doing some new frontier things. So the question is, how do we tune up and keep improving ourselves? How do we draft properly? Here's what we've been doing. On the point of culture, first, our company, we've realized, is a designed experience for our staff as well as our clients. And we have to actually do both of those things at the same time. And that is really hard. We have to think about how we work with and treat our own people. Otherwise, we can't recruit good people, or those people won't stick around. We've got to absolutely live this in our own tools and processes, because if we don't, our team doesn't believe in what they're recommending, and our clients can tell. As trusted advisors, we also have realized we have an ethical obligation to consider guiding our clients toward better solutions that displace our own current offerings. That's a big deal. And when we feel like these things are too hard, we have to dig deep and find out why they're too hard. Does that, is that because we have the wrong people that we're working with? Is it because there's something about ourselves that we have to look at? At our firm, we've systematically adopted new frontier tools across our entire business, all the way from Google Apps and Evernote for collaboration, all the way down to Xero, Basecamp, and Google App Engine to replace our prior use of QuickBooks Daylight and FileMaker Pro. On the production side, the day I found out about the Jamf Cloud offering, I signed us up immediately. We made the jump from getting about a dozen JSSs live, and our legacy self-hosted JSS will be retired within the year. 
We were excited about the JAMF Cloud because we're always on the latest and greatest. We don't have to spend any time maintaining that infrastructure. And we know that we get this kind of one call does it all experience with JAMF when we call our account manager. So we've got a lot of those running. We also use Forget Computers Device Scout uh, as a product dashboard across all the JSSs. And I'm also pleased to encourage you to check out TransPack, which is a new packaging service from my pal Paul Su, and we're users of that as well. So I bring these up to demonstrate that although we decide to make Casper a core piece of technology, we subject our own working process to the same new frontier vetting that we look at everything else. And what we realized was that we could embrace these ancillary services in order to keep our focus on where it belongs, which is on differentiation. Instead of managing a JSS or multiple JSSs, we can focus on giving our clients a great experience. That's a piece of work I don't need to be doing anymore. Right? And there's other products too. There's lots of great things out there that can augment your Casper suite so that you can change your workflow. Uh, Alan Hancock's got Watchman Monitoring, that's great. Forget Computers also has Robot Cloud. Um, check these things out, look at the costs, consider what you could do with an extra two, five, or 10 hours a month on your own marketing, on the experience that you're providing to your clients. So what's our strategy right now at our firm? Well, we've decided to head where the complexity is. And it turns out that that's not technology per se, it's people. It's their passions. It's the clients that we work for. What are the things that they actually care about? Because I can tell you that making sure their email server is up to date is a good government thing that they don't necessarily care about. They care about something else. They care about the thing that they started their business for or the thing they get up in the morning to go to work for. How can we be part of making that thing that they care about happen? So in general, in the past, we have not been invited into offering an opinion or solution about the core problem that any of our clients are working on. And, and that's not because we can't help them, it's because it didn't even occur to us to ask that and it didn't occur to them to ask us. So every local competitor of ours stops at the waterline of doing a scope of work and says done. And from what I've seen, they don't really hold themselves accountable of is there a provable business outcome here? Is there a provable success? So what would it take for us to step into the business problem fully and actually design a way of working and the tools that are needed to make an end-to-end -end solution that solves the problem? You know, we have to modify the way we talk about our work and what our goals are. And then the question is, will our clients be more responsive to a different way of working? This is a concept we've been using in a lot of our client conversations lately, is to try to highlight that, yes, there's a part of what we do that's infrastructure, but in order for them to do their best possible work, there's more factors at play here than just the technology. There's the workflow, there's their own internal culture. You know, Apple talks a lot about you can't use technology to solve human problems. The iPad is designed to be a user-focused device. You can't lock it down, that's by design. So if you've got a reason that's driving you toward wanting to do that, that's a culture problem not a technology problem, right? So we're giving this advice now in a way that we weren't giving before, and we're trying to provide them solutions at actually every tier of what's up there. So some other specific ideas we've been working on. Um, we know that a lot of businesses want to remove waste and improve efficiency, so we can consult with them on workflow improvements using new frontier tools and actually help them through that process. We also know that every business has content that they're, and a message that they're trying to get out to their own team or their own clients, and we can consult and partner with other companies to develop that and then actually help them distribute and send that content out. These are just other ideas we've been working with. So we've, we've kind of realized we can offer experiences, we can offer integrated solutions, and we can maybe even offer our own products to our clients. One of the other things that we've done to actually live it is we've updated all of our branding and messaging. We updated our site, our marketing materials to talk about our positioning in this new way, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. People are asking us what we do because they can't figure it out. And that gives us the opportunity to give them that answer right from the get-go and reset the expectation that they would have come into the relationship with about some legacy idea of what technology and IT are. So another point to make is we've put our people first. There's no logos on here of other products and other companies, expertise above all else. So then the question comes, is there still an opportunity to sell traditional managed services contracts? I think for desktops, maybe there is for a little while. 
I think for on-premise servers and infrastructure, uh, which is also really just about downtime, downtime responsiveness, uh, there is for a little while longer. But I think if you're in that business, you should double check whether that's actually what's best for the client or whether that's just your own model. For managing a client's cloud-hosted services or software as a service, yes, I think there is an opportunity there to provide some value. But the profit is very, very thin. And usually, it's only useful in aggregate as recurring revenue or as part of a more meaningful consulting opportunity. So there are some things we have to do to start chipping away at the reputation of IT, the negative reputation of IT. We have to be enablers. We have to find a way to say yes instead of no as often as we possibly can. We have to confound those initial dismal expectations of what IT is in a lot of the business world and deliver a delightful experience that leaves people totally disoriented because it's the only way to reset those legacy expectations. We have to avoid the use of trigger language, behaviors, and old procedures that make people think we're here to do command and control. Apple's already trying to tell us that, but we have to do in our own professional practice to adapt to that. The last thing is that self-service is our first and best option for everyone. We will inconvenience ourselves at our firm in order to provide a self-service experience to clients. That is actually the fourth big takeaway from Jamf. It turns out the Casper Suite's killer feature is self-service in this new way of thinking. That is the best possible thing you can do from a positioning perspective with these clients is to start talking about how you're empowering them to take care of themselves. So experience. Our brand, our products, our services create an experience. Well, you know, experience design and service design, it turns out, are actual uh, disciplines with real references that you can go out and read about and look at how people are doing this work. So a definition of experience design is a systemic approach to look at opportunities, frame problems and projects, and evaluate solutions. Service design, which is very apropos to everyone in this room, whether you run your own business or not, is about making the service you deliver useful, usable, efficient, effective, desirable. So it takes a lot of work to think about this and to work on it. We have been busting our butts on it. And I would say we're not even a third of the way through, but the results have been dramatic. If what I'm talking about sounds good, you need to go buy this book. It's called Service Design Thinking by Mark Stickdorn and Jacob Snyder. It's really good. There are many forms of design, but do you know what service design is? When you have two coffee shops right next to each other, and each sells the exact same coffee at the exact same price, service design is what makes you walk into one and not the other. Innovating services include various disciplines beside design. There's a common language to let these disciplines work together efficiently as a team. It's called service design thinking and is based around five principles. First of all, service design should be user-centered, so services are experienced through the customer's eyes. It should also be co-creative to ensure that all stakeholders are included in the process. Hello. Sequencing visualizes services as interrelated actions, and evidencing makes them tangible. Finally, service design should be holistic, so the entire environment of a service is considered. Service designers use many tools, like stakeholder maps, personas, customer journey maps, cultural probes, storyboards, service prototypes, service blueprints, and many, many more. There's a new book about these tools and how they can help you design better services. This is service design thinking. One good thing about this is they also give you these great tools and a lot of downloadable resources you can use and just start workshopping through what you're already doing in your own shop, how you're helping your own clients, internal or external. It's really, really useful to help you start thinking about these things and, and map a way forward. So I didn't feel like I could stand up here and talk about this without showing you some proof of what's been happening in our business since we started doing this. Remember that line about demonstrating value by doing valuable things? This client of ours, Women Care Global, it's a global nonprofit uh, providing training and resources around women's health and family planning to medical professionals worldwide. Uh, they're an existing client with a managed services and support retainer. And we fell totally backwards into a really cool project with them just by, again, starting to ask questions about what it is they're doing in their work and where we could potentially help. 
They were really surprised that we asked that, that we were even interested, and they questioned whether we could play a role in their line of business work as well as their back of house work. So this is the cool Jamf conference map. There's not many red dots here, but we're gonna add a couple. So this is Kisumu, Kenya, and Johannesburg, South Africa. The project that WCG brought to us was that they were doing field work in these countries, researching medical outcomes. And what field work means is that somebody gets on a motorcycle and goes out in the middle of nowhere where there's no power and no internet for two days at a time, going around to little community clinics, trying to gather data about what's happening, what's working, what's not working. So that entire workflow was paper-based when we started working with them, and it took them four to six weeks to make a decision and change anything about what they were doing based on the long delay it took to gather this information from the field. So the problems to solve were offline collection, uh, storage, distance, ruggedness, uh, providing training, and replacing a paper-based workflow. So we chomped right onto this. We dug in, we got into the messy human side of the problem, and we ended up doing a complete end-to-end -end solution in a way we have never done before. After understanding the business problem, we found a way. We found this really great tool called iForm Builder. It's a clipboard replacement product that stores all its collected data in a cloud-hosted database, but it will cache it locally on the device until it has an internet connection. They have a web-based form design tools and JavaScript capability for us to create all the form logic. We brought in a, a form designer, somebody who actually does that for a living. And when each new record is uploaded, it captures the GPS coordinates so the project admins can see pin drops for where every single record is. The product had open access to the data via JSON, XML, and RSS, so that's a new frontier criteria that we looked at. And what that let us do was build reporting on top of that using a product called Clipfolio to create reporting and dashboarding um, that updates in real time. It also let us create PDF-based email reports that we sent out on a recurring schedule to the project admins. So Sparktivity, we procured the iPads, custom provisioned them with Apple Configurator, enrolled them in our JSS, shipped them to the field staff before the app was done being developed, and then by the time the iPads had cleared customs four weeks later, we had our customized app ready to go in self-service and ready to be distributed. On PowerUp, this is what an end user saw. Put in their Exchange password, they're getting the prompt about installing iForm, and this is a little training video that we put together that kind of shows how you do it. You know, there's, there's pick lists, some of these built-in iOS widgets, um, free text writing areas. So this, these pics here are from a conference of doctors and, and nurses in Kisumu. And what they're doing is getting together to talk about how they're gonna improve this data collection, how to improve medical outcomes in these rural areas. So our project lead on the client side, a woman named Mary Fierstead from WCG, she presented on how the system would work. She brought in five new staffers to receive training. And over two days of training, Sparktivity, we Skyped in. We taught everyone how to use iForm Builder, what the workflow was. We switched off Wi-Fi so they could see how offline data collection works. And we also used this, these are some slides from the training, showed them how to log into the app And you know, this is the interface that they would see for the forms that they needed. Here's where they could pick a form that they were gonna use. And they could actually see the records they were caching as they went. <coughs> and we were also able to provide value in this project by leveraging the iPads for other business communication needs, as well as like personal productivity stuff. And we were able to give them basic support, whoop, basic support on what to do. What do you do when iForm stops working? You delete it and you go back to self-service and you download it again because none of your data is in that app. So going forward, at our firm, we've been providing the platform tweaks, the fixes, the small changes. We've been testing new features and we get the every once in a while support ticket request from users in the field. But what this combination let us do was take that time to action from four to six weeks to four to six days. So you can imagine the client was pretty pumped about that. We've been more profitable on this project than in the last two years of their traditional MSP project, sorry, MSP contract combined. 
and we feel really good about this project. The field reps like it. The client is way more excited about this than they were about anything else we've ever done for them because, again, this was right where their passion is. This is right at the core of the business that they do, not back of house, but line of business. And it's been a mutual success to everyone. This led me to my fifth learning from Jamf, which is that we can use the Casper suite to distribute content and other solutions, and we should all be looking at that because this, this framework is something we can stand on top of and build on top of. So what's our wrap up? Ask yourself, are you drafting the right trends, the right people, and the right companies? Are you part of this new thing or not? Look at your positioning. Look at where you provide value to your clients and ask yourself if you're at the center of their work and their passions. Look at your culture and that, in your, and that of your clients to see if you're really living it and if they're really living it. And look at what experience you're providing and how you're differentiating. So two, two quotes. I love this quote, Upton Sinclair. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. Don't be someone whose job or livelihood depends on you not understanding the new frontier. And then this was from that movie. You know, the two coffee shops. I think about that all the time. What's making people walk into ours and not other ones? If you use these tools and many others, you'll be the obvious choice in the places that you're competing. I think we can do this. I think a lot of us are already doing this. We should do it. So if you've got questions, talk to me or John. There's our Twitter up there. Um, for resources, these slides will be up on Jamf Nation. Those are links to the places where some of those ideas come from. And then these are the folks who have shared their ideas and conversation with me over the years and have helped me think about this challenge. Thanks for being here. So, yeah, do we have any questions? Uh, great presentation, by the way. But um, I was wondering about what you guys think about in terms of security while vetting all these, um, you know, cloud services and everything like that. Yep. And, you know, in terms of partnering with them, some of them drop off. So, how do you guys account for things like that happening, where things seem so dynamic and you really don't have control over it? That's a great question. So we definitely take a look at those track records and those things that happen with different companies like Dropbox and their vulnerability issues. But I actually heard someone describe this in a way that I was like, that's really good and I'm totally stealing that line, which was, who do you trust, saying this to a business owner or, or a client, who do you trust to protect your data more, me or the security operations team at company X that has their own data center and a huge security team and that's all they do? Do we trust that, that server that we're running in-house in our own network that's not physically secured, that's inside a closet? Or do we trust a data center with biometric security and all kinds of other things? You know, I, I don't know that there's a clear-cut answer to these things, but I can tell you that the wind is blowing in a certain direction. So we're trying to, we're trying to be going in the right direction. Just, you had Sean Costello listed as one of your people. He, he just was elected to the ASMC Board of Directors, which I've been serving on for five years. And mm -hmm. just, I don't know if you knew that, but that's a really cool thing for him. And also, He's a great guy. 15 years ago, Alan Hancock was actually one of my employees. So Very good. Um, but you said you, there's a lot of higher level thinking in, in your presentation here, but I want to drill down to one thing in, on a practical level. You mm -hmm. said you discovered Casper at an ACN event in 2010. I did. And can you talk, and you said, hey, after that, we could delay hiring and we could automate a lot of things to your clients. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you give us some specific examples of what your workflow was and what kind of clients you were dealing with at that time and how you implemented Casper and specifically what you, what you did with those sure. clients to, to change that workflow for you that improved, that had a measurable improvement on your business? In other words, and, and what you were charging for that, all of that, kind of give us a, a specific example there. Absolutely, no problem. So one of the things that was in, um, and still is, in a lot of our service contracts is this idea of routinized maintenance, you know, which was an old concept. And like I talked about, you know, I had worked at a VAR. My business partner had worked in internal IT. We had these things that we had kind of brought with us, and we didn't realize until a couple of years in, wait a minute, why are, we, why are we doing this? Is there value here? 
And that routinized maintenance was one of those things where we were really trying to stick to what we said we would do, which is to go to these different client locations, go to these different machines. And, and we were doing some things with scripting and remote desktop, and we were VPNing, VPNing into those machines. We didn't have to like go to those places every single time. But there was a lot of rigmarole to go through all that. Um, and you know, things like software updates, for example, or repairing permissions, or looking at disk errors, or looking at OS 10 server installations, and looking through logs and things like that. We had this kind of laundry list. And we realized that we could automate all that stuff to at least take that tier of it off of us. And then the self-service thing was interesting. We didn't quite realize, again, what a, what a nexus that was for positioning, but we started doing it. And it made people happy that they weren't having to put in a ticket to get Firefox updated, for example. You know, they were able to just go do it on their own. So that freed up a significant amount of our time. You were doing that for self-service? Is that how you were managing that? After Casper? Yeah. Yeah, after Casper, we were using self-service. Yep. And before that, we were doing all kinds of things. I mean, we played with, you know, InstaDMG on the imaging side, and we, we had all kinds of little hacky pokey things we were doing. And, you know, the Casper suite, we knew of that product. We knew that it was in the education space, but I just didn't quite see that that could be useful to us as outbound consultants until I saw that. And I went, that's what we need to do. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for asking. So my question isn't really about your presentation, but the end, the iPads. Do you have any good end user after the training fact for that? I, I would say there are a couple things. Um, one is just that metric of no support tickets. I mean, in two years, there have been, or about 20 months, I think there have been three tickets in, which are really more about application problems with iForm and synchronization than they were about the iPad. So I think that's a big success. Um, but you know, it's funny, you go into that type of a situation working halfway across the world with a lot of ideas of what you think is going to happen. <clears throat> There's a quote from William Gibson, the writer, he says, the, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. You know, I thought that the future was less distributed there than it actually turns out that it was. So the folks that we were training were on Blackberries, they were, they were doing stuff already. I thought we had a larger gap to cover, and that's because of my own ignorance, not because of reality. So the fact that we were able to have some camaraderie and fellowship there as we did that work and just make a connection, that was, I think that's a big success for us. So. Could you walk us through the timeline for that project in terms of how the customer saw it and whether you invest in development? Or how does this new frontier project come? Well, you know, I talk about that one as a thing we fell backwards into because we fell backwards into it. It was a kind of a wild process where, you know, we had a defined scope and what our contracts were. And just as routinized account management, we were just chit chatting with somebody and talking about, yeah, I'm going to Johannesburg, blah, blah, blah. And then it just sort of came out. And there's this thing, I think, where when you help people solve their problems, they start giving you more problems, right? Which is good. It's good for us. So, they just sort of started casually talking about the fact that, yeah, we got to figure this out, and you know, we got to, we got to figure out how to get this data, and it's really difficult, and a six-week thing, and it's just, it's screwing up our distribution and our inventory and all these different issues. So we started listening to it, and because we were already kind of thinking in this way, we just, it was just a lucky thing that we heard that and went, ooh, I think there's a thing there. So we did invest a significant amount of time pre project agreement, pre-scope of work, just trying to understand what it was, and then you would hang up the phone and we would sit together and go, wow, can we do this? Like, is this possible? Is this, are we gonna stick our neck out there and try this thing? And we decided to go for it. So one of the things that was super crazy about it was at the timeline to implement, we basically came in at half the price of another solution they were looking at that worked in the NGO space with USAID and the UN. And they were doing this crazy thing with Java-based apps on flip phones. And it was awful. And it didn't work where there was no service. There was no caching and all this other kind of stuff. So we were able to come in at essentially half the price. Um, out of that budget, a significant portion of it was implementation. And I think we got the first version of that working in less than three months. 
when we shipped when we shipped the iPads, like I said, the app wasn't done and the form design wasn't done, and they were still arguing about what fields we were collecting. And so we just pushed that raft away from the shore and hoped that by the time it got to the other end, we would have it figured out. So maybe not the most recommended way to do that. <laughs> just putting that out there. Anybody else? Actually, I'd say that by pushing that raft out there, you probably got them to do something about it. So by pushing that raft out there, by shipping, it got people to say, ooh, I, there's a deadline. I can't stop, keep arguing about this. I got to make a decision. That was useful. Um, we redesigned half the form logic about halfway through the project when the project admins started to understand that with a relational database, you don't have to relist every single field on every single form. So they needed some education, and we took them through that. There's one in the back there. <laughs> no problem. Hey, Joe. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I've taken more notes on this than, uh, than I have in the past day and a half, so uh, thanks for that. Oh, thank you. Um, we're a traditional Mac house, so Apple authorized reseller, service provider, training center. I feel you, man. Yeah. Yeah, I, and, and we've seen this shift. I've been on board with the guys for Jam for about three years now. Uh, again, as soon as I saw the product, I said, yeah, this solves everything. Um, the moving away from the VAR model uh, and taking that leap of faith and jumping across into the, to the consultancy and into the, into the professional services end, uh, it's something that I've been trying to do for the last couple of years. Um, and it's very, very hard to extract yourself away from the Absolutely. miserly profits that, that you're getting from the application and, and the bolt-ons around it. Yep. But um, in that change that, that, that you made, uh, was it a defined, right, we're going to give this a go for a year, we're going to head down this line and damn the consequences? It's a good question. I think coming out of that prior experience, and I don't want to you know, be, be negative or anything, but we just, we just had this gut feeling that we just had to flip that over. And at first, I thought maybe that whole like passing through at cost thing, we tried some stuff where we, we did pass it through that way. And again, that I'm not going to pay a lot for this muffler thing. People are so confused when you start doing that. They're like, no, but really, what's the real number? No, but really. And I'm like, no, but really. Here's an invoice from Ingram Micro. Right, And it took a little while of that before we were confident that it was going to work. I will give one caveat on that process. Here's the thing I didn't figure out until a couple years in. I didn't figure out that by leading with professional services, we were being brought into some engagements that were already well underway past the point of purchase where we couldn't give any advice about the proper design at the get-go. Yeah. And, and part of that problem was when the client starts that process, they're thinking about it in their head at stuff, not what do I do and how should it work and what am I trying to achieve. They're starting at gear, especially if there's internal IT, they're starting at gear. So I realized we were missing out on that part of the conversation and potentially great opportunities to provide solutions where we're not even being brought in the room until something's on fire. You know, So that is a caveat I will give. And my solution to that has been, I found a VAR in North Carolina who's very forward thinking, Tim Hassett from Apogee, he's a great guy, and we just, we've, we've connected. So we're not the same business, but we share information with each other and I'll, I'll come in and help him with design on some things. And when I need stuff sometimes, you know, that's, that's the place for people to go. I can't speak to that extraction. I know that that's really hard and I don't mean to make light of that. Mm -hmm. I think um, it was really hard at the place that I, uh, had worked previously, and it's tough, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, as somebody who's 15 months into that, I, I, I'm kind of, it's weird. I'm literally sitting between both of you figuratively and literally. The hardest part for us has been the, is managing a high dollar, low profit margin business to a low dollar, higher profit margin business and supporting the infrastructure as you go through that migration has been our greatest challenge. Because with 12 retail stores and a bunch of you know, and, and employees and all that stuff, 
and managing the transition to the importance of understanding managed services and knowing that only about a third of your existing sales force is going to really be able to do it. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, that's the, the, the really the hardest part for us has been the intellectual portion of, of wrapping our heads around it and making sure that we do it in a way that doesn't drive both divisions of the company yeah. into the ditch first. And we got lucky because we got a fresh start. But to that point, it, I feel like it took me two years to just shake it off a little bit. I don't doubt it. Yeah. So guys, that's our time. We gotta make some room for the next session, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, if you have more questions for Joe or myself, we'll be around the rest of the conference. Please just grab us and start asking away. Thank you.